you notice we've stuck some of these around the chairs and we'd like for you to take them but we really would rather for you to take them and give them to someone someone that you know who who does not have a church that ought to be in our church and I uh, hope you'll invite them to Easter and our Good Friday service on there and our egg hunt. Um, hope you'll take those and use those. I think there's more out on the welcome, welcome desk as well. Well, we're looking at the book of Hebrews, and I hope you all are enjoying my friend Darwin who are in small groups and watching that. If you're not in a small group and you want to do that study, you can do it on your own. Uh, just make sure you have Right Now Media, and if you don't have Right Now Media, Call up church office this week, and they'll walk you through how to get it, okay? It's free to you, and uh, the study's on there, and there's a lot of other good studies on there. If you don't have it, you ought to get it, because it's really a wonderful tool for you to have. But anyway, I've talked about this something better. The situation that's going on is that the writer of Hebrews, I believe it was Barnabas, by the way, and uh, but the writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish Christians. And the Jewish Christians are leaving the church in droves. Some have said it's because of persecution, and, and, and that could be true. But I really believe it's more because they're just disappointed. They're, they don't like the fact that the church isn't Jewish enough for them. Uh, we see that in Acts. We see that in Romans, we see that in Galatians, where the Jewish Christians are having a hard time with, first of all, letting Gentile Christians come in and not become Jewish. They're having a hard time not following all the Jewish customs. Uh, they're worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday. They're not keeping the Sabbath. They're, they're not uh, eating kosher. They're not doing all those things. And the writer of Hebrews is writing to these folks and saying, don't leave the faith. And what you're not understanding is, is that Jesus has fulfilled all of those things you've been doing and then some. That Jesus is better than anything else. I would say that to you, to you who are watching. Serving Jesus is better than anything else you can do. There's nothing in this world that you can do that is better than serving Jesus. Uh, and so it's very important for you to understand that. But I want to today talk about something better, and we want to talk about a better high priest. Now, the writer of Hebrews basically pronounces Jesus three things. He's a prophet. He's a king, and he's a priest. The Jewish Christians were okay with, okay, he's a prophet, and they're okay with the fact that, okay, he's a king, but they say, oh, no, 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 he can't be our high priest. He's not of the lineage of Aaron. Again, they can't get over themselves. Uh, that's not the way I was raised. That's not what I was taught. It's not what my mama taught me. Well, maybe your mama was wrong. You ever thought about that? Maybe mama was wrong. I know that's heresy for some of y'all. But you know, you can honor your mama and still not agree with everything she said. I can't tell you, but they were, that, that's what they were doing. They go, he can't be the high priest. Why, he was out of the person of Aaron. And I, folks, all of us have things in our past that we were taught that we value that may or may not be true. The real question is not whether I was taught that when I was a kid. The real question is, what's truth? What's God say about it? Did they misinterpret the Bible? And I can show you in Baptist life where we've misinterpreted the Bible a lot. I'm not going to that. But we don't agree with the things that they first started off with Baptists. It's certainly for not the Southern Baptist group. We've changed. Folks, these folks had a hard time getting away from their upbringing. Jesus could be the high priest. Well, let's talk about what a high priest did. 
that is a model. The, uh, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, so that's not what it is. But this is a model of what they think it might have looked like. It would have been a marble with gold. It would have been pretty impressive, wouldn't it? But they had an altar sitting in front of that building, which would have contained the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is where God was, okay? And if you remember, back in uh, Exodus, they created a tabernacle, and they created a place where God would come meet with Moses. Do you remember that? Called the Holy of Holies. And then he got Aaron to be the head of the priesthood, which was Moses' brother, tribe of Levi. And they would make sacrifices to God. And they believed in kind of a portal. We'll talk more about this as the sermon goes on. But that that place right there would have been where God came to talk to people. Now, I've been to Israel a few times. Ellie makes a big deal of this. And the other guide I had, Makes me, Ellie was Jewish, and, and the other guy that I had was an uh, Arab Christian. But they both made a big deal out of where Jesus was raised in Galilee. Uh, they didn't pray there. You went to synagogue, they didn't pray. They just read the scripture like that because you prayed where God was, and he's in Jerusalem. And so that's why three times a year they went down to Jerusalem because they wanted to get close to God so they could pray. Okay? And so they felt like that's where you had to go to talk to God. Pretty important place, wasn't it? Now, once a year, now in the Holy of Holies, nobody ever went in there. The Ark of Covenant was in there. And, uh, but you, the high priest would go in once a year. It's the only time he would go in. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And he would take a lamb, a sacrificial lamb. And he would go in there and sprinkle blood upon it and make intercession for all the sins of the people once a year. Okay? But they felt like that's where God hung out, so that's where they would go pray. When we go to Israel today, we go to the Western Wall. That's the symbolism about it because that's about as close as I can get to the, to the uh, Holy of Holies where it was. Uh, it's kind of interesting, but that's where they think God hung out. It's where he had to go talk to God. But the writer of Hebrews is going to let them know things are different now. Things are different. And, uh, you know, before you had to go do a sacrifice, and the priest would do a sacrifice. He'd put it on the altar right there where the aroma would go over to, to, to God. But they would slaughter a lamb, or if they were poor, it would be a dove. And they would put uh, the, the organs and the fat part in the, in the sacrificial fire, sacrifice that to God, then give the meat, some meat to the priest, and then give the rest of it back to the family to go have a, have a meal. That's how that went. That's how you got forgiveness of sins. Uh, I still think we need to be cleansed. That's why every Sunday I have a time of confession before we begin worship. Because let's face it, we've sinned, haven't we? We need to be cleansed. I don't know about you, but I sin all the time. And some people don't think they sin. I worked for a guy one time. It was uh, not in church work. It was, I was in college, and I worked uh, in the Oklahoma Welfare Department one, one summer. And the guy who we worked for was a strong Christian. He was a good guy. But he was of the opinion he could live a perfect life. He was in the holiness group, thought, thought he could live a perfect life. And he basically looked at me and he said, he knew I was going into ministry, and he said, Robert, uh, I haven't sinned in seven years. If you would have asked the people who worked for him, they could have named a lot of sins he did. <laughs> Good guy, but lived in denial. And like they say, you know, denial is not a river in Egypt. <laughs> but, uh, but we all need a priest. We all need someone to, to, to bring us in. And you know what? We got one in Jesus. 
the Jewish believers couldn't understand it, but this guy's going to, the writer of Hebrews is going to argue, we've got it. So would you stand, let's read a little bit what, what God has to say about this. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. That is why we must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as theirs. And no one can become a high priest simply because he wants such an honor. He must be called by God for this work, just as Aaron was. That is why Christ did not honor himself by assuming he could become high priest. No, he was chosen by God, who said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And in another passage, God said to him, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We'll talk more about him in a minute. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and, and tears to the one who could rescue him from death, and God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. And God designated him to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. What does a priest do? Well, a priest, truthfully, is one who ushers us into the presence of God. He intercedes for us for, to God. That's what the priest was doing with that temple I put up a while ago. They would do the sacrifice and, and their prayers would come in for you. But that's all going to change. Because before, it was the high priest who had to go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur to make sacrifice. Now, guess what? It's Jesus is a high priest that ushers us into the presence of God. That's what Jesus does. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he's our high priest, we can come in to the presence of God. Our church is looking for a new pastor. And over my 40-plus years of ministry, I've had committees call me and say, you know anybody that would be good for our church? Or maybe somebody has used me as a reference, and they call and say, you know, this guy's used you as a reference. What can you tell me about him? And they all ask some questions, but most of them want to know something. I mean, they want to know, is he a good guy? Can he preach? Is he a good pastor? Blah, blah, blah. But they usually want to know something else. And they don't always ask it in this kind of questions, but you kind of get the feeling. Their question is, can this person bring us into the presence of God? And my answer to that is, no, he can't. But he can tell you who can any pastor worthy salt will point you to Jesus who could take you to the presence of God. You do not want a pastor that thinks he can take you to the presence of God. And no pastor died for you on the cross. And uh, you know what I'm saying? Any pastor worth their salt will point you to Jesus who will take you into the presence. That's what you're looking for. And my friends, Jesus will do that. He'll bring you right into the presence of God. Look what Hebrews says in chapter 4. So since then we have a great high priest who has entered heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold firmly to what we believe. And then I like verse 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. I like this. He says, come boldly. When you go talk to God, you don't come sheepishly. You go boldly because you're going with Jesus. Right? I've told you this story before, but some of you haven't heard it, so you need to hear it. When my son was, I don't know, eight, nine, and probably younger than that, six, seven, he loved to go to Chuck E. Cheese like every kid, right? And so he wanted to take some of his friends for his birthday, so I got some of his buddies, and we went to Chuck E. Cheese, ordered a bunch of pizza, and they give you so many tokens with it where you can go play skee-ball and all the games and stuff. But I, that wasn't enough tokens for me, so I went and got extra tokens, and I was handing out those tokens to those kids, and I was just going, 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 going out. And then there was this kid who reached up his hand, I didn't recognize him. He got in line with him. I knew he didn't come with us. So I'm thinking, oh, who's this kid? And my son comes up and says, it's okay, Dad, he's with me. Folks, I want you to know something. On our own, we can't go in the presence of God. But when we go, Jesus is going to say, okay, Father, it's okay. He's with me. And we can go right there to the throne of God. And we can pray. I love how Revelation puts it. When we pray, it's like incense before God. See, God wants us to pray. He wants us to be part of that. Uh, but he says, let's go boldly to, to the throne of gracious God and look what we'll receive. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it in, in most. You can go to the throne of God and you're not going to get judged. You're going to get mercy. You're going to get grace. That's good stuff, isn't it, folks? That's right out of the scripture. I ought to read it sometimes. It's pretty good. <laughs> Secondly, Jesus is a high priest that understands our temptations. You know, it's not like Jesus doesn't understand. Jesus was tempted. He, the Bible says he was tempted in every way. Whatever way you're tempted, Jesus was. And he overcame it. And uh, the writer of Hebrews in chapter, verse 15 puts it this way. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So he understands. He understands what's going on with us. That's pretty cool, isn't it? We're going to Jesus who understands. He's made the sacrifice for us because he understands. And then the third thing. Jesus is a high priest that is timeless. Well, let me just go ahead and read this. Jesus was before Aaron. He was here at the beginning of the world. He's going to be here when it ends. And he's going to live forever. Verse 12 says, And if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. So the priesthood's changed, folks. We don't need Aaron and his group anymore. We got a new one, new sheriff in town. Jesus is our high priest now. For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at the altar as priest. What I mean is our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, and Moses never mentioned priest coming from that tribe. So he's just going to take them directly. He says, okay, I, I agree. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah and you think that he ought to come from the tribe of Aaron because that's where 
they come from, right? That's where you, that's, that's how I was raised. That's what mama taught me, you know? But he says, think about this. This change has been made very clear since a different priest who is like Melchizedek has appeared. Now, who's this Melchizedek? This is a cool character in the Bible. First of all, I've got to show off my Hebrew, okay? Melchizedek is made up of two words. Melech, which means king, and Sedek, which means righteousness. King of righteousness is what his name literally means. But this King Melchizedek has appeared. Now, some of you don't know who Melchizedek is. So I need to tell you, because you need to know. We find Melchizedek in the Old Testament with Abraham. This is long before Moses, long before Aaron. And if you remember, Abraham and Lot, their tribes, were, their, their flocks and stuff were getting so big, they had to separate. So Lot went towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham stayed over there towards Hebron and different places. There were some folks who came from a long way off and captured Sodom and Gomorrah and, and, and all, and they took Lot and them away, and one of the servants escaped, told Abraham. Abraham took his crew, and they went and got them back, got all the people back, got all the possessions back, and were coming back. As they were coming back, there was this guy by the name of Melchizedek. And the Bible says that he was the king of Salem. Now, again, knowing Hebrew helps. Uh, king of Salem of the city of Salem. Salem is spelled the same way as Shalom. City of Shalom. Do you know what Jerusalem means? Anybody want to guess? Jerusalem. City of peace. Okay? So he was the king of Jerusalem, but he was also a high priest, and he was a high priest to who? The one true God. Well, he's not of Aaron. He was well before Aaron. In fact, he was serving God before Abraham was. And so, the writer of Hebrews is saying, you guys hadn't read the Bible. Or you wouldn't be making this argument. There was a priest before Aaron. And Jesus was there long before Aaron. He was there long before Melchizedek. He was there at the beginning when the heavens and earth were created. But let's read chapter 7. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement, by belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He says, this was prophesied in the Psalms. Go read the Bible, boys. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. He said, it wasn't doing any good. We got a new one. For the law never made anything perfect. But now we have a confidence in a better hope. I like that word better, which appears a lot through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus, for God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. So he says, we have a better priest, and he's going to be priest forever. I want to go back and talk a little bit about Melchizedek. Those of you who have been with me to Israel have seen this. It takes a little bit to get down to this. We've got to go down some tunnels, go down there where they're digging. And not many people get to see it. The reason is because our guide, Ellie, is the one that found it. He's the one that discovered this. And what he tells me it is, and what he tells us it is, is that you see that flat rock that's on it? That's where they believe Melchizedek sacrificed animals. 
Now, what you can't see, and I didn't get enough pictures, uh, is that there's some grooves in the rock going down where the blood would have ran away. So we knew sacrifice was going there. Also, right next to it is an old olive press, which they would have anointed the animals before they did it. So Eli is convinced that that's where Melchizedek did his, did his things. You see the rock on top of that? There's another story in Genesis. You remember when Jacob was running from Esau and he spent the night someplace and put his head on a rock and he had this vision, this dream of a ladder of where angels were coming and descending. And he woke up. You remember what he said? Now let me tell you what he said. It's not a test. You can look it up if you don't believe me. He got up and he said, I was in the house of the Lord and didn't know it. He didn't say I was in the presence of the Lord. He said, I was in the house of the Lord. It's the word he used. And basically what he said, I didn't realize I was here at a portal where God was. Okay? And so the Bible says that Jacob put a rock on top of the other rock. Now, I'm telling you, very few people got to see that because most groups don't go down and see it. We get got to. I remember Gary Cameron said, I feel like I need to take my shoes off when the first time we went there. Pretty holy sight when you think of all the stuff that happened there. But can I let you all know something? It's really cool to go see that. And I hope all of y'all, I think every Christian ought to go to the Holy Land sometime. If you can physically do it and you financially able, I think you ought to go. But as cool as it is to go over there, because we have Jesus, we can experience the Lord right here. We don't have to go over to Israel down to where Melchizedek was at. We don't have to go to the Western Wall and stick a little note into God. Because you know what? Lord Jesus has made it where we can go and experience God anywhere. We can experience Him here. You can experience Him at home. Now, they knew that. Jesus knew that. He was kind of a rebel. You know, the Lord's Prayer, we say every week, Our Father, who art in where? Heaven. He didn't say, Our Father, who art in a room in Jerusalem, did he? He said, No, he's in heaven. And from heaven, he can see everything. He's around everywhere. He knows everywhere. David knew this, too. He didn't, I mean, he's the one that set up, for his son Solomon to build a temple, but he didn't believe that God was just in one place. You ever read the, the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd. He's with me. He leads me beside the still water. Well, he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shallow death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So he says, you know, when I'm eating, when I'm drinking, when I'm just walking the past lives, you're there. When I get ready to die, you're going to be there. And even thou preparest to table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He says, even when things are tough and people are trying to hurt me and people are trying to like that, you're there. And anoint my head with oil. That's probably a way that they kept the sheep healed and things. And when we're sick, he's there. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David knew you can experience God anywhere. 
We have a high priest today, folks, to where we can go to God anywhere we're at. In your car. In your house. On a walk. On vacation. God's there. And you can be in His presence. In fact, not only can you get to be, He wants you there. That's what's so amazing about it. Are you walking in God's presence? Are you letting Jesus usher you into the presence of God? If not, why not? Would you bow with me and close your eyes? Maybe you're not experiencing the Lord the way you ought to be. I'm going to pray. Maybe if you agree with what I'm praying, you can just say, me too, Lord. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that Jesus will usher me into your presence anytime, anywhere. I want to be in the presence of God. And I receive Jesus as my Savior. I ask him to cleanse me of my sins. I know I confess I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins, and I want Jesus to come into my life. I want his spirit to come in and dwell with me, and I want to live in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for loving me that much. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.